Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, Stephen Pinecker, and folks, many of you know that I have said almost since the beginning of this channel that I am a self-professed evangelical fanboy of Rod Meldrum. I want to tell you, four years, it's been four years ago now, folks, four years ago, I started engaging almost uh, very much more frequently. Now, you got to understand, I've been watching Rob Meldrum for years, okay? Watching his videos, watching all his conference talks that, you know, that they talk from the firm foundation, watch it Wayne May. Um, of course, I've got a good friendship with Jonathan Neville. And but four years ago, they did a Come Follow Me series on the Book of Mormon. And we all have to say, Rod, Rob Meldrum, you are a Book of Mormon guy, right? That's your that's your sweet spot. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you guys did this really fascinating Come Follow Me series, and you had this just a variety of guests come on. And you have to understand, Rod, you know, I tell people, I said, you know, as an evangelical, I went the opposite direction most people go. I went from studying anti-Mormon literature to scholarly literature and, 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 and different uh, media to then faithful. And the faithful was really important for me as an evangelical, as just when the the idea of me doing a channel was still in the, in, 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 is, I don't even know if I'd come up with the idea of doing my channel, but I was watching your series and I thought, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm a fly on the wall as an evangelical hearing these, these Latter-day Saints talk among, talking amongst themselves and realizing how much evangelicals and Latter-day Saints had in common. And it really was instructive to me. And it really helped me, give, give me a fuller picture of what do believers of the Book of Mormon actually believe and how do they think? And 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 just and, and, and it really humanized you in a way that you were more than just a person that I was reading about in an academic journal or, you know, some historical figure. I got to see flesh and blood people having conversations who are firm believers in the Book of Mormon. And speaking of firm, Rod Meldrum of the Firm Foundation. Yeah. I like that. It's a long intro, but I'm a fanboy. Oh, well, <laughs> to the, back to the program, sir. Well, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. I, uh, I, I, I'm, 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 you know, shocked. I mean, you know, I didn't realize that you've been, uh, been, uh, you know, uh, watching our, our, our. Oh yeah. All of I... our different research and that kind of thing and, and books. I mean, we've had, uh, we've had a pretty, pretty crazy ride actually when it comes down to it. You know, starting from, uh, from just one DVD to now, you know, there's hundreds of books and 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 all kinds of you know, and channels and and videos and all kinds of people making additional information that's it's that's like i said in the very beginning um i kind of feel like i was i was involved with the with putting together kind of the framework if you will of the uh, of this whole heartland movement but uh, I, and i always said that there's going to be more people who are smarter than i am with, the, with their expertise and their their uh, knowledge and and the experiences that are going to flesh this out in a lot bigger way than than I ever could. Yeah, you so know, it's, it's been fun to see that, watch that happen. It really has been. I mean, look, I <clears throat> I was watching you very closely for a long time because I realized, okay, Rod is on to something, and this is going to be a growing thing, and it has. It's really taken off. I hear, yeah. I talk to people all the time who, like all my life, I was a meso guy, and then I started watching Rod reading his books and it's really changed uh just kind of just changed everything for people yeah. and and so more and more people and not only that rod but not because of course I'm, I'm plugged into you know the utah-based saints but i'm plugged into believers in the book of mormon throughout yeah. the world from many many different expressions all the and restoration branches and so forth yeah all the different restoration branches and they're jumping on board um I, I mean apostles and groups and all that are jumping on board what what you guys are doing so i think it's really fascinating uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I recognize that you, like in many ways, John DeLynn, when he had you on Mormon Stories, said, you're bigger than me, Rod. You're even bigger than, than, than John DeLynn. And in many ways, that's true. You, the, mm -hmm. second only, I tell people the biggest event in Mormondom outside of General Conference are the firm foundation conferences that you put on. It's yeah, bigger they, than they any become that, conference, yeah. bigger than Sunstone. Bigger than anything, so and it's growing in influence and everything like that. So I'm just truly fascinated by uh, the, the conversations you're having, uh, the research that you guys are doing, having conversations with the likes of Jonathan Neville and everything like that. But we're going to continue this conversation. I want to talk more about, and I also want you to preview some of the Firm Foundation events that are coming up. But actually, one of the reasons you actually wanted to come on my program was you wanted to address some criticisms that have been directed your way recently, vis-a-vis -vis some, some controversial people and events that have happened over the course of the last six months to a year 
Um, regarding uh, the Daybells, of course, I've had Chad Daybell's neighbor on my program during the trial and discuss things, but also the uh, the situation with Tim Ballard and Visions of Glory. And I just wanted to give this opportunity for you uh, to kind of address some you of bet. the criticisms that have been directed towards you. You bet. Well, basically, so pr probably get, we ought to go back a little ways uh, to, uh, to kind of how the uh, the firm foundation and our expos and our and our international book of Mormon evidence conferences kind of how they all started out because it actually was you know pretty benign for when I when I first started doing the research and this is kind of it goes back to about two thousand um, two and then two thousand three and right around in there and then I started doing research and and I actually came out with my first DVD called DNA evidence for Book of Mormon geography. That was back in 2007, I think it was, if I remember correctly. So it was quite a long time ago. And and, and it's interesting because I, I um, was doing this research and I found, you know, the this controversy about DNA in the Book of Mormon and, uh, and how there was no evidence for the Book of Mormon from a DNA perspective. But then uh, what happened was is that uh, I, I did this research and I started finding articles uh, talking about this haplogroup X DNA type that that uh, talks about all in, in North America, and uh, and and that had they they weren't Asians they were they were they were uh, you know um, Caucasians basically. Um, this the haplogroup X DNA was found in in places like Italy and Israel and uh, and other places and you know around the world. So um, I I wanted to. to just get this information out to somebody. And at the time, Fair Fair Mormon and uh, and, and kind of Farms was still uh, the the two really primary outlets for this type of scholarly research. And uh, and so I thought, well, I'm just going to you know just dump this information on you know, over to them. You know, they they have the ability to get it out to the members of the church and things like that. And uh, so I I just was going to just you know give all this to the, the research to them. And I'll never forget, I thought, well, you know, probably farms is not going to be very receptive <laughs> to this research because they're pretty, pretty blatantly, uh, you know, Mesoamerica uh, oriented. And, um, and, you know, I mean, even their, their, their logo is a Mayan glyph, right? So mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I figured they're probably not going to be very open to this idea of the, of the Book of Mormon happening in North America, which is where the DNA was pointing to. And, uh, and so I ended up by getting a hold of Fair Mormon. And then they said, well, well, we want to have a conversation with you and we're, we're going to have a, a conference call. I said, that'd be, that'd be great. I'm doing some presentations out in California at the time. And uh, anyway, so I ended up on a, on a phone call and about, oh gosh, I think there must have been eight or nine or 10 uh, fair Mormon uh, individuals. And I was there at my uh, at my uncle's home in, in, in uh, Placerville, California. <laughs> and and I was just like shocked. They, they they got on the phone and basically like, who are you and what are you, you know, and, and what's your credentials and this and that. And, and then they were just grilling me left and right. And I was like, whoa, hold on here. I, I, I just want to give you some information. You can do with it what you want to. And uh, anyway, I realized at that point in time that they that they were not at all interested in in uh, some any, any new information, that they were as well on the Mesoamerica um, bandwagon, if you will. And and uh, and at that point, I thought, well, how are we going to address this DNA issue? Because when you sequence the DNA from, you know, the Mayan civilization down in Central America, there's they're not Hebrews. They have no indication of any ancient Hebrew DNA in any of the uh, the peoples down there. So uh, that, that's when I realized that if this information is going to get out to members of the church, I'm going to have to do it myself. And I kind of honestly... <laughs> Felt a little bit like a, you know, like David versus Goliath or something. You know, it's, here's here's a guy, no credentials, nobody knows who I am. I don't work for the church. I don't work for BYU. I'm just a researcher working on another science book project, and this is kind of a side a side thing for me. And um, and then it just kind of blew up. I mean, we had uh, I had, had a couple of presentations, then we re recorded the DVD, and we had like gosh, it was like 120,000 DVDs go out within about a year or so. Um, which I was shocked about. And um, 
And then people said, well, we want to know more and so forth. And then other people, I found I found Wayne May. I, I had done the research before I even knew Wayne May. And I had a friend of mine down in Arizona said, well, uh, there's this guy. Have you ever heard of Wayne May? I said, um, not really. <laughs> now, Rod, I, I want you to know, I've been reading Ancient America since the 1990s. So I knew about right. Wayne before you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I didn't even know you know, about that. They said that, that this guy by the name of Wayne May is going to be doing a presentation on the archaeology of the Book of Mormon in North America at the Provo Library. It's just right down the street from your house. <clears throat> I said, well, what the heck? I'm going to go. So I, I remember coming. I, I came about a half an hour early because um, I wanted to see if I could have a chance to actually meet with him and just tell him this some of this DNA research and so forth. But, of course, he was setting up and everything. And uh, I'll never forget that uh, uh, he had suitcases, like, um, you know, suitcases that are not not like, you know, like travel suitcases, but like uh, artifact suitcases, um, full of artifacts. And I was looking at those and going, oh my gosh, I've never seen this kind of stuff before, really. I mean, I've never studied this, you know, the archaeology in North America. I mean, who, who studies that? I mean, it's all sound in Central America, right? Anyway, um, and I had brought a camera with me and I said, do you mind if I take any pictures of this? And he said, oh, absolutely. Just take, take all the pictures you want. And uh, it was this is this is back long enough ago that Wayne was was using a a slide projector, so you know like the <laughs> yeah, slides, <laughs> and I was just mesmerized by his presentation. And after the after everybody left, I said uh, Wayne, I, you know, I introduced myself and said, you know, I've got some interesting research. I think you'd be you, you'd like to take a look at it, whatever. And and uh, we started talking about uh, DNA and and uh, my research. <laughs> we ended up going down to Wendy's because it was late at night and picked up a couple of Frosties and sat there and talked until about two o'clock in the morning in his, in his, in our car. So it was, uh, and, and that was, that was the beginning of a, a long time friendship with Wayne May. And, and you know, he, and he's, he's been kind of the, uh, the guru of, uh, of the archeology span part of it with ancient American magazine and, 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 and the other work that he's done on that has just been phenomenal. So, I'm uh, I, I I'm really you know grateful to Rain, to Wayne for kind of getting the ball rolling. I've always called him kind of the you know the grandfather of the Heartland research. Although it wasn't called Heartland at that time, it was just a North American you know model mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. I I I, I kind of coined that term Heartland research because of the fact that it was in the Heartland. You know, people have you know the Mesoamerica. You know, it, it tells you the geographic location and the and the best geographic identifier of you know, where the Book of Mormon took place, according to our research, is the heartland of America. It's the Midwest, you know, area, which is oft, often called the heartland. So, in fact, it's, you know, you can look up Wikipedia and look up heartland, and that's what it says, basically the Midwest. So, you know, Rob, I, I just want to interject something that's so interesting, yeah. is that so many people grew up with, in their mind, the Book of Mormon events taking place in uh, in, in Mesa, America, right? Um, yeah. uh, Mesoamerica, excuse me. And uh, and I, what's so fascinating for me is I was a young child, and I want to say, I don't know if it was produced by the church, and I think it might have been a documentary or some segment on some program, and it might have been talking about the book, He Walked the Americas. And they showed this scene of Jesus appearing to Native Americans, and there were teepees, okay? So in my mind, that imprinted on me the, yeah. the events of the Book of Mormon happening in North America. So I've always had, so so I was a heartlander, if you will, ever since I was a little kid. And it took me years to realize that I was finally in high school when I was look, look closely at those Arnold Freiger paintings in the Book of Mormon, when I thought, hey, he's got Mesoamerica stuff on there. Yeah, you know, I, I never, trees. but yeah, yeah. And the I, Jaguars. <laughs> yeah, so it was funny how it never clicked for me, but for whatever no. reason, I always pictured the Book of Mormon events happening in the heartland. And I also remember coming across where Hugh Nibley even said that the, the Book of Mormon events can best be understood within the context of the mound builders. So yeah. those those are two data points for me that kind of, I'm just, I know we're, I'm digressing, but I just want you to understand why, and for me, it, it was really easy for me to be open to the premise of, of the heartland hypothesis is because I kind of was, that's kind of how I was 
picturing the Book of Mormon events happening as well. That uh, I just want to give you a little background there. But. Well, you know, it, it is interesting how similar our backgrounds are in that in that case. And I didn't know that about your background because you know when I grew up, I mean I had parents that were fantastic. I mean my my dad was a missionary in the Central States Mission, which is also the heartland, <laughs> amazingly. But he didn't have a single convert baptism in the, in in his mission. And uh, and he came back to uh, BY Academy, met my mom, and and they they decided that if they if, if he couldn't have uh, you know have any converts to the gospel on his mission, maybe they could raise up some converts. So so as they as they had our family, they were they were totally stalwarts. I mean, I have to give you know total credit to them. Um, we grew up uh, having scriptures every morning, and you know and 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 uh, before we went to to uh, do our chores and stuff, we had a dairy farm, and anyway, so. Uh, I mean, we had our family home evenings. We went to church, you know, and back in that time, you had you know, two or three hours in the morning, had another two or three or four hours in the afternoon. <laughs> You'd come back to church a couple of times. I mean, it was, you know, there was a lot there. There was a lot of uh, welfare, um, farm work that we would do and, and so forth in our area. And then there's things like raising, raising money for, you know, building church buildings and so forth. Anyway, doing all of this, um, it really gave me a love for the Book of Mormon. I, and I remember as a kid reading the Book of Mormon, reading about, you know, a mighty Gentile nation above all other nations. It was a land of liberty and it was a land of prosperity and security. And, and you know, that their Gentiles would be gathered out of other nations, you know, to come to this land and and about the New Jerusalem being on this land and so forth. And I just, and I just knew that's that's talking about the United States. It's not, you know, that's that, I, don't, I don't think that's describing Mexico or Guatemala or, or even, you know, you know, Canada or whatever. They said, talked about it being a nation among other nations. And so I kind of grew up with that in mind that I, I lived in the promised land. Basically, I felt privileged enough to be able to be born there. <clears throat> and then I when I when I got into junior high school, started going to seminary, I started hearing all this stuff about, you know, and seeing, you know, the Arnold Freeberg paintings <laughs> and so forth about, you know, that shows the the the, uh, the palm trees and the, you know, the the the, the, the massive stone pyramidal temples and so forth there. And I was like, whoa. And I thought, well, I get, you know, people are a lot smarter than me are coming up with this stuff. So I must not be, you know, I don't know, maybe there's something I've got messed up or I missed something. And so I kind of just went along with that, that, that you know, well, well, that, that's not, not a big deal. Um, you know, for the, uh, for the Book of Mormon to be um, maybe down there, you know, wasn't, didn't affect my my overall knowledge, but then as I got more and more into it, it's kind of like you said. All of a sudden, it's going well. Well, gosh, that doesn't really. Hmm. Some things just don't seem to match up there when it comes down to that. And I thought, well, maybe it's all of the North and North and North America. Maybe it's all of the Americas, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But as I've done more research, I found that that's actually not the case. There's actually, um, you know, there's 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 a couple of uh, mistaken identities <laughs> when it comes down to. Uh, you know, Joseph Smith and what he said, he talked about Zion and he said, all of America, North and South is Zion. And other people, even in his age, actually thought that what he said was all of North and South America is Zion. That's not what he said, according to the historical record. He said, all of America, North and South. And, and that was right at the same time when he had had the revelation about the, the coming civil war that was that was about to turn, you know take place. Right. He talked about the North and the South being you know, divided and so forth. Uh -huh. So I started to come to some, you know, um, more realizations and kind of like you, you know, it, it's, it, it just seemed like it, it fit North America. But then, you know, I went on my mission to, uh, to Italy and I remember uh, film strips, you know, of, of uh, you know, showing people film strips of Central America, you know, about the Book of Mormon. And, and even in the Book of Mormon uh, editions that were being put out by the church at that time, the blue, the blue version and so forth, they had pictures of, uh, of of Mesoamerica. Yeah, that exactly. Yeah. I have I have a couple over here in my book set, book bookcase, but they have pictures of Mesoamerica and so forth. And I thought, well, what the heck? Anyway, so that's why I kind of felt like I was uh, David going up against Goliath because it seemed like the church had made its made its position there. there there's Machu Picchu and uh, and and other you know uh, uh, drawings and paintings and so forth and frescoes on the walls and things are all showing Central America. Well, you notice that all that stuff has been taken out now. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no more of that going on in any editions that the that the church is putting out, which I'm grateful for because it because it it um it was kind of like a you know I felt like 
uh, we were being taught this, you know, pretty specifically that it was definitely Mesoamerica, um, you know, for dur during, you know, seminary and institute and so forth. And so it's almost like if it's, if I go against that, I'm literally going against the, my upbringing, you know, and, and, and my teaching from the uh, <clears throat> church education system from CES. And so that's, that's, that's hard. You know, I mean, you, you know, I, I don't ever want to be, you know, at odds with the, uh, with the church and it's, and it's, uh, you know, teachings, but then, um, but they, but the problem is, is that this Mesoamerica theory was just literally causing so much problems within the church, um, especially as more and more information was coming out about archaeology and about linguistics and about, uh, you know, and the DNA thing and all these different uh, things were, were pointing that, uh, that, there's no way that Mesoamerica was the setting for the Book of Mormon. And people were losing their faith over it, quite honestly, Steve. And so that's the, that's the other, that was the other issue. And, and uh, it, it didn't really affect my faith too much because of the fact that I had a really powerful spiritual experience before my mission that, that uh, was undeniable. And so I, I've, I've been, you know, a hundred percent on board from that point, but you still, I, I hate cognitive dissonance, <laughs> you know, <laughs> meaning where where your heart is telling you one thing, and your and your education, your teachings, your you know your, your the, the the things other people are telling you something that doesn't seem to fit and doesn't and, and there's this this disconnect between your heart and your mind, mm. and uh, I, I, that's that's the way I kind of uh, look at uh, cognitive dissonance. Anyway, so. Um, I just I, I needed to find something that that fit better with what my heart was saying, and uh, when I when I when I read the Book of Mormon and read about this mighty Gentile nation and so forth that uh, that would be raised up and lifted up and set up and and they have all these prophecies about it, that's when I started doing research on this and that was really uh, where I where I came to my my uh, belief that that maybe is it possible that the scholars got it wrong, <laughs> and then. When I went into Joseph Smith research and started working with uh, the, the the church history, it became very clear that Joseph Smith knew uh, where the Book of Mormon took place and uh, and that it, and everything that he that he and, and even more than that, even the Lord even said in Revelations to Joseph Smith, where you know, when he, where he he you know called the missionaries to go to New York and Ohio and Missouri and they went there and. And I, and I was just like fascinated by all of that. So yeah. that's kind of the background between that. But but the bottom line is, is that, you know, um, you mentioned about some of the, you know, controversy and, and being involved with different people and and uh, that kind of thing. I, I probably, I would like to kind of address that a little bit. Um, I think I've been pretty clear and I've, and I've said numerous times, I'm, I'm very conservative. When I look at conservatism, what, I, what I'm saying is, is that I like to, I, I think that the things of God that have been brought up to us in the past are still valid. Um, I, I look at progressivism as being basically moving from the things of old and progressing into new, new territory, new ideas, new ideologies, and those kinds of things. So, so when I when I say that I'm conservative, um, you know, people think that that's that you know, that's has something to do with a uh, with a particular political party. <laughs> And honestly, I, I have to say, I'm probably, I'm not that comfortable with either party. I'm more comfortable with uh, with the more conservative parts of the Republican Party, but I don't think that even many of them are 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 that. So we try not to get it to make it you know too political, but I, but I'm not ashamed to say that I, I I am one that wants to stand for the things of God that we know from the past to be true, and if if the if truth doesn't change over time. Then, I think there's a, there's there's something to be said for for maintaining a uh, the past uh, understandings, um, because if they came from God, then I think that's that's um, I don't want I, I don't I don't want to move from God is the point. Mm -hmm. So that's basically my where where I'm coming from. So with that in mind, when we have our when we have our uh, our expos, and and I, I <laughs> it's kind of interesting to me how. These uh, these these our conferences have become like like you said in the intro. Um, there, other than the church's general conference itself, these are the biggest events 
draw the biggest crowds, have the most viewers, et cetera, than any other um, subgroup within the church. Um, I, I, I don't say that to brag. I, th I, I think that actually shows a lot about the membership of the church and how they and their, their desire to find um, things that that go along with their their um, their faith, their belief, um, their desire to follow God as well. And so that's I, I think that's the reason why that these uh, that these conferences have become so big. I mean, they're big enough that there's only two or three places in the state of Utah that that are big enough to handle the event. You know, so it's you know, so we have the Davis County Convention Center, that the uh, the Mountain Mountain America uh, uh, Convention Center there in Sandy, and then the Provo Convention Center. There's a there's a couple of other ones that that uh, we've done things in, but uh, but now with the advent of the uh, people, older people specifically finding finding the internet and being able to use it after COVID, you know, a, a lot of our a lot of our people tend to be older because they're you know more conservative uh, you know people, and so they tended to be older. We we are finally reaching a lot more now of the uh, Gen X, Gen Z, um, you know you know, folks and, and, uh, and because we're trying to reach them in the mediums that they're, that they're familiar with and used to. Um, but it is still an uphill battle when you're talking about conservatism versus, you know, progressivism uh, within the world. I mean, you know, that, that, you know, there's, there's such a, a move away from traditional Christianity and traditional religion in general and, uh, and and we're losing a lot of this younger generation to a more progressive ideologies that uh, that are are not as consistent, I don't think, with the with the doctrines of of the gospel. So uh, so we have had a lot of conservative speakers. <laughs> now, when people say, "Well, you associate with you know the likes of you know, uh, I mean, I could name off a whole bunch of different people, you know, but probably one of the most, uh, I guess I would say infamous at this point in time was, was uh, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> people try to connect, make some kind of a connection there. I did want to just kind of clear that up just a little bit, because um, even though we, we have, you know, I mean, the, the possibility of making a connection somewhere is pretty great when we have two, two major events a year. We have one in the spring and one in the fall. And we average about 70 to 80 speakers at each event. And sometimes we have the same speakers come back, you know, quite often, but we also have constantly new speakers that we have coming in uh, to share their, their thoughts on a lot of different subjects. And it's kind of funny because I've, I've even had people who come in directly, you know, against my research and say, you know, I'm, that I, I've, I've got it wrong or whatever, you know, debunking my research. And I've had them actually come and speak at my conferences as well. So we, we're fairly open Unlike a lot of the Mesoamerica guys, they, they it's pretty much if you don't if you don't walk the line on the Mesoamerica stuff, you're not going to be invited to speak at their events. And I've I've never been invited to speak at any of their events. We've actually invited them several times to speak at ours, but they usually won't. Um, but we've had other people who are not as completely um espousing the Mesoamerican setting that have come and spoken at our, our, our events as well. So we have a, a wide diversity. We have a, a lot of people who are not of our faith, actually, uh, archaeologists and and uh, linguistics people, and um, on all kinds of different people. You know, from from astrophysics and, and astronomy and that kind of stuff aspects. <clears throat> and you even you even had evangelicals come, like David Barton has spoken to your group. Oh right? yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. But basically, my my goal is with these events is to is you know truth. You know, what's the truth? Um, I, I, I've often told, told people in around me in my circle of, uh, of, of, of people, um, that if you ever catch me actually being more, more interested or more passionate about defending my position than I am about finding the truth and you call me out because really when it comes down to it, the only thing that really matters when it comes down to this is what's the truth. And there isn't a dozen truths out there. I mean, that, that's what that's one of the things that, that drives me crazy about uh about progressivism is it's kind of like truth is whatever you think it is. But I but I that that comes from a human-centric, uh humanist, you know, viewpoint. And being you know based on God, I think there's only one viewpoint that matters, and that's God's view. So we need to align to him. <laughs> okay. And 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 his gospel. 
not go off on our own tangents with uh, whatever we think is, you know, when we wake up in the morning, are we male or female? I mean, you know, it's, that's it's, there's, there's just simple truths out there. Um, and there's, there's, I know that there's complications with some of that kind of thing um, with people with uh, same sex attraction, that kind of stuff. But bottom line is, is that you still are, I mean, 99.999% of everybody is born a specific sex. Right. And uh, so biologically that's, that's what we are. And then, and then, you know, other things, you know, influence our, our, our thoughts about ourselves. But anyway, but the bottom line is like, like I said, we're, we're, we're a conservative group. And whenever you have literally, I mean, we have 450 speakers presentations on our streaming website, which is the largest repository of information research ever assembled on the Book of Mormon uh, within the uh, within the the, the the Mormon you know uh, faith basically the the Latter Day Faith groups, um, and so we uh, so the chances of having somebody go off the rails and right. get weird. Is 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 um pretty it's 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 high. I mean, you know, it, we we do our best to try to to vet people and to make sure that they're not saying uh, or doing or 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 living things that are not compatible with our faith. Um, but you know, but people hide things too, so you know, you, you just don't know what's what's really going on. So back to uh, so as an example, people say, well, that Rod Meldrum guy, he and Chad Daybell were like pals. Um, first off. I only met Chad Daybell probably twice in okay. my whole life. Um, one of those was at a, at a conference where I was asked to come and speak and they were asked and he was asked to come and speak as well. And after, after the event happened and I heard him speak, I told the event organizers that if he's going to speak anymore, that I'm not coming to their events anymore. I will, I will not speak at their events if he's going to speak. I just, there was just something about it. I had the, the, the other experience I had is I was helping the people who were uh, who were involved with with uh, uh, organizing these these events, um, they were moving. I, I was helping them move from uh, from Rexburg, Idaho, back to Utah, and we were and I I had plantar fasciitis really in my feet at that point in time, and I could I could barely you know walk because of the pain in my feet, and I was up there helping them move. And I said, well, I, I you know I. I have I, I brought my truck and a trailer and so forth for them to put stuff in, but uh, but I I said I I can't help you move much because my feet are just in such pain I just can't do it, and they said well if you can just bring the truck and trailer well anyway long story short there's not many people showed up to help him move, ended up moving stuff <laughs> into the trailer, and Chad Daybell shows up at their house, um, he had done several several podcasts and so forth with Chad Daybell. Um, and was quite close with Chad Baybell and, and, and Chad comes into the house. Um, we had introductions and so forth. And then he proceeds to sit down on the couch and watch while the rest of us are, are helping move stuff. He just sat there. I was kind of like, what the heck? You know, usually people, especially friends and so yeah. forth, they, they, they would, they would pitch in and help move stuff. And he didn't, didn't lift of, a he, he didn't lift a finger for anything and so I, I was like okay that's just kind of weird yeah and then, I, then, then i heard some stuff that he had done on avow the avow website which is uh another voice of warning website um i've never been involved with that um i know a lot of the people who are involved with that and, and were and and so forth and and so uh anyway long story short is that uh i i, I heard about a um I guess he, I don't know if he called it a vision or a dream or something about this train um, that he was on and it would start off as like a, a, a slow moving locomotive and then moved into kind of a, a faster, sleeker train and pretty soon it can turn into like a bullet train or whatever. And that he was kind of in the front of it, guiding the train along with the presidency of the church. And, and that was just like, okay, yeah, there's something going on here. Um, and so I never had him speak. Um, he, he, he never spoke at any of my events. I just never felt comfortable with that. Um, he seems like a nice guy, but I don't know him you know, very well. And I, I, I had seen Lori Vallow a couple of times, but I didn't know anything about what was going on with them and uh, so forth. And I'm, I'm just grateful that we didn't really, that we didn't get involved with any of that stuff. So any kind of trying to, trying to make a connection between myself and, and Chad Daybell, is it's not there okay know? not there okay and yeah. uh and so so 
just to just to clarify, when you went to move your friends, was that the first time you met Chad Daybell, or had you seen been speak or heard him speak? And then uh, just I just want to know the timeline. Um, I I'm trying to remember which came first, like that, because they because that was uh, Mike and Nancy James were the ones that were putting on the preparing the people. Okay. Um, thing and uh, and they were the ones that invited him, and they were the ones I said that I I won't speak unless you know, okay. unless he's not speaking. There was there was another um um Julie Rowe was another one that spoke at their events. Yeah. What did you What did you think of Julie? Um, I never did actually meet her. Um, okay. Although she was at one of the events that, that I think she was at that same event that Chad Daybell and I were all speaking at up in Rexburg, Idaho. Um, but after that, um, but again, she never spoke at any of my events either. Okay. You know, so, uh, so, and they, you know, I mean, basically, so, um, some the, the you know, uh, Mike and Nancy, um, uh, James are, were very, very, um, involved with the dreams and visions people. Mm -hmm. And although I think dreams and visions are important and, uh, and, and they're, and so forth, I think they're private. <laughs> so okay so my personal feeling is is that as, as a general rule um you know the people who've had dreams and visions and, and it's interesting because you know even in the in the in the scriptures i mean you look at the, in the bible you know i mean you have nebuchadnezzar has a dream and pharaoh has a dream they have these vivid dreams but they don't know the the translation of them what what does this mean they have to ask other people to do that and so um i think that that's you know, there's there's a lot to that, and in fact, that 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 plays a little bit into uh, my my friend Tom Harrison with Visions of Glory, because he had all these things. He didn't he didn't want to share it. He had these things for years before he began to even uh, let anybody know that it was there. And when he met with John Pontius, it was John Pontius that actually was pushing him to to uh, to share these because they are they're um, really powerful events that happened in his life and and he saw these different things but but even uh tom harrison i had uh, you know, opportunities to talk with him i fact in fact he came on one of my tours and we spent two weeks uh touring the the heartland research back there um that so if you know visions of glory um that, that you know um he's he's the spencer of visions of glory i think everybody knows that by now so hopefully i'm not divulging anything that's not supposed to be but when i talked to him uh, there were things that were put in the book that, you know, everybody has their particular lenses that they look through. And John Pontius has his lenses. And so as Tom Harrison was trying to explain his dreams or or visions, whatever, to uh, to John Pontius, you know, that, 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 that communication is never perfect. And there was quite a few things that after the book was, after John had finished putting the book together, that, that there are quite a few things that... Um, that Tom was going, I, I need to make more clarification. This is not quite right. It's not, I don't think that it's coming across what I was seeing quite perfectly. Okay. Uh, apparently he tried to make some changes to Visions of Glory and the uh, and, and uh, Cedar Fort Books, which is the, which is the publisher said, no way, <laughs> we're already selling thousands of these books and we own the copyright when we, when we, when they signed, you know, for them to be the publisher. And so, uh, so they wouldn't allow him to make any changes. So I, I know that there are changes that Tom would like to have made that there what, he wasn't able to do so because of the publisher. And uh, and that and that's I mean I'm not picking on Cedar Ford either. I mean you know basically that, that's pretty typical you know uh, you know publisher you know author contracts right and so forth. So anyway, so the um, so that's another another person. People said, well, you're really close to Tom Harrison. And the answer is, is yes, I, I consider him a personal friend of mine. Um, you know, is, is he off on, off in the, in the weeds? Well, as far as I know, um, I mean, when I, when I, the last couple of times I've talked to him, I mean, he was the Bishop of their ward. There are uh, more, I, I guess I would have to say progressive leaning uh, scholars in the church to, who have taken issue with some of the things that he had in his book and uh that kind of thing so i understand that that but that but then again there are people who will attack anything that has to do with you know uh a conservative viewpoint um within the church and i mean i've been attacked wayne's been attacked i mean you know jonathan's constantly being attacked i mean bottom line is is that there there is a 
there's a group who feels, I think, and I, I, I can't speak for exactly how they feel about it, but I think that they feel like that we have come in and just kind of ruined. They had everybody believing in Mesoamerica as the setting for the Book of Mormon, but you'll find that the, pretty much the same groups, the same people who are pushing the Mesoamerica thing are also fairly progressive in their, you know, in their views on evolution, for example, and their views on, you know, Joseph Smith and, you know, the, 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 the stone in the hat thing and, and, uh, you know, the, on the translation and, you know, that Noah's flood wasn't real, that uh, the Book of Mormon may not even be a real history. It may be a, a, a you know, a, an inspired fiction. And those kind of progressive ideologies that we that we disagree with. So, that's so basically, kind of, the way you was, see it is from your perspective. And keep in mind, folks, I've had progressive people on my program. I've had messed sure, people on my program. Sure. I've had transgender I, I, people I, on the program. So I, I, I just let people know that that's so, so that's it's, it's full full disclosure. You know, yeah, <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying think, to hide the fact that we're conservative. You're conservative, and you believe that what you're doing is standing up for the Book of Mormon. And you're standing up for your faith, and you feel that it's under attack um, in your mind by by people from progressive elements, and that they're trying to undermine the church and the church's authority, and they're trying to undermine this historicity of the Book of Mormon. And you feel like what you and your organiz organization are doing is you're providing a space for people who are encountering these criticisms that they have a place they can go to, and that there are other people that believe the same they, way they do, and that they have concerns and fears of what's going on in the world, what's going on in the country, and that the Firm Foundation is a place for those people to have a safe space and 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 be be authentic believers in the Book of Mormon that can can uh, to that can compare notes and network with each other and have friendships with each other and and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of what you're you you're providing a place a space for people who believe that the Book of Mormon is literal history and and th and they're and and you want to have a, a place for them and, and that's that's what you're and give them a platform. Yeah, that that's that's well said. I mean, I I couldn't have said that better myself. <laughs> I don't think that was. That was very, very well, uh, very astute, mm -hmm. as far as, uh, as as your perspective on on why we do what we're doing. Yes. Um. So, but there, but there are a few other people, you know, that uh, that are are, well, we're kind of almost like superstars, and now have become, you know, uh, you know, uh, have had all kinds of attacks on them. Um. One of those that uh, people are, are very much uh, interested in is is Tim Ballard. Yes. Yeah, you know, and so so I, I wanted to kind of just relate a little bit about Tim Ballard because uh, he's been also under attack. <laughs> I, I have to say it's kind of kind of like the old the old uh, adage that that no good deed will go unpunished, right? <laughs> so if you if you get into the um the, the into somebody's grill enough, um at, at first people try to ignore things, right? They just like with me, they just try to ignore. Okay. That, that's okay, little boy. You know, you, you, someday you'll grow up and and you'll learn the, the facts and so forth. And so they just try to ignore it. And then once it gets to a certain level, where they're getting pushback from a lot of other people, then they start to address it, usually by attacking it. And then, I mean, but and, and this all goes through the whole Thomas Kuhn, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> scientific revolutions and so forth. You know how that, how, how revolutions actually happen. Um, and, and and bottom line is that then after after they they realize that they're kicking against the truth, then they begin to embrace it, but then they start to own it, and then they call it their own. Now, yeah, well, we believe this the whole time, and and so you do see that kind of thing, and, and we've been we've seen that transition from for for thousands and thousands of people over the course of time. Um, as at first they're, they're, they're in disbelief. Now this is apostate, you know, this heart, heartland thing, a bunch of apostates. This is not what the church has been teaching and so forth to then going, well, um, actually they make some good points, <laughs> you know, and then to, well, actually, I think this makes more sense than the Mesoamerica thing, which is, I think the reason why the Mesoamerica thing has been dying a, a slow death. And, and, uh, you know, when, when I say that, I'm not, I'm not trying to project and I'm, I'm, I'm just just simply based on the fact that um you know we have the the number one best selling books in the church on the subject of book of mormon geography we have the biggest conferences i mean when we when we when we have our podcasts and so forth i mean everything seems to be you know people people appreciate 
the research and being able to not have it force fed, but actually have an alternative idea that seems to, to fit better with the Book of Mormon. I think that's the reason why people uh, enjoy and appreciate the research that we've been doing. But it's, but it's still been kind of like, you know, David versus Goliath. I mean, we're going up against a highly, highly educated, highly funded um, have the, uh, the 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 eyes and ears of the of the leadership of the church, you know, way more than we do, are invited to be parts of committees and things like that that we've never been invited to be part right. of. Yep. Um, and and yet, because of the uh, because of all the, the 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 number of people who are now uh, espousing basically or at least cognizant of the the, the Heartland research. Um, they can't really ignore it anymore. Well, you know, and I do want to clarify one thing, Rod, just to be fair, fair here, that not every single person that's a Mesoamerican advocate is necessarily progressive. There are conservative, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, faithful yeah, really Latter-day Saints that and 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 that that uh, you know believe in the historicity of the Book of Mormon that are also Mesoamericans. I just want I just want to be fair and be clear. We don't want to broad, you know, because people brought paint you with the broad strokes. I want to make yeah. sure we'll do it for the other side as well. That they, yeah, and, that, and, that's, and that's a really good point. Now, I mean, and it's kind of funny because I haven't had a lot of association with most of the guys who are in, you know, in the Mesa America um, arena. And, um, and, 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 you know, I, I wasn't invited to come and talk to them or do anything like that. You know, so we, we kind of had this distant relationship, but Jonathan, on the other hand, you know, being a, 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 a doctorate you know and and uh, and, and mm -hmm. so forth and having gone to BYU and had all gone down that path right they couldn't just ignore him and and uh, he actually knows a lot of these guys and because of that and a couple of other we had a couple of instances where we actually were able to get together and and I think that two things happened for, at least for me one of them is I, I I saw them as you know just just seekers you know people who are trying to find the truth as well um, they, they have, uh, you know, pretty much hung their hat on the Mesoamerican idea, but, uh, but they're good, decent individuals, nice guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd love to, you know, have lunch with them, you know, have dinner with their families and their, and I'm sure their wives and their families are awesome and so forth. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, I, I think for a long time, they thought of me as kind of like the devil incarnate, <laughs> you know, yeah. that I was destroying everything that they've built all these years right. and so forth. Um, but I think that they, but they also got a little bit di of a different sense of who I am and that I'm not a, a crazy, you know, wild eye, you know, nutcases just going off to try to, you know, for some odd reason. I mean, basically I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a TBM, you know, true believing Mormon kind right. of thing, you know, and, uh, and, and so a lot of the attacks that initially happened, um, and, and and by the way, you know, I I will have to say this that I I don't see that the attacks were coming from our side. Um, it was pretty much a one sided deal. I mean, they had literally um, four or five different websites filled with attack stuff against us. And if you if you go on my website, you still I mean, we we address where we differentiate, but we don't attack personally. We don't say, well, you're just dumb, or well, you're just not a scholar, or you you know, or, or those kinds of things, you know. Um, you won't find any attack stuff on our sites because that's that's contention. Um, mm -hmm. You can have you can have honest debate without being contentious, and uh, and and I I see the contention that that people talk about having come ninety percent from their side. Uh, I know that's that that again that's my perspective, you know, yeah. as being on the receiving end of that. But the but the bottom line is is that uh, that they well, have um, and Rod, can I just let me? A just lot of them are you. just really super nice guys. I mean, I had Matthew Roper when my when my son oh. passed away, hmm. he showed up at my son's funeral. Hmm. You know, and I will never forget that. You know, he's. Oh. Um, I mean, what? Who does that? You know, especially if it's somebody that they don't particularly appreciate. Um, I just thought that that was a really human thing to do, and I I I appreciate him. No, that's we haven't had any really conversation since then. But if Matthew Roper happens to be watching this, I, I give him a shout out, man. Right. A lot of good guys. I, I I wish we had more association. Um, mm -hmm. but again, I I think that they kind of look at me as the uh, pariah. Yeah, <laughs> still. 
Yeah, yeah you know, and it, it, it's fascinating because I remember the first time I had Jonathan Neville on my program, and I'm just this tiny little channel that nobody's ever heard of. And I get attacked that say, well, this this Steve Pinecker, he's he's an evangelical, he doesn't know the lay of the land, he doesn't know anything about Jonathan Neville, and said, you know, and just was really critical that I would even platform Jonathan Neville on a tiny little YouTube channel. That was too big of a platform for the Heartlander hypothesis, right? And so yeah. And so then, and, and this is what was so crazy. I, I, because I knew I was that, on. That, I'm it, going, I, I just think, but doesn't, but doesn't that show kind of a, I, I guess I'd have to say this. I, I look at one of the ways of progressivism, progressive ideologies is to not address what they're saying, but to actually try to deplatform people. I would certainly say that that's you, more. You don't see you, yes. you don't see us as conservatives trying to get other people shut down to shut down their message, but progressives that is one, that is one of their primary methodologies of trying to uh, to basically to shut down the debate, right? Yes. By deplatforming and, and saying, well, you know, uh, we're we're gonna we're going to uh, you know censor anybody that's that that doesn't agree with us. That is a progressive ideology in my view. Well, I, I have to. I also have to attest to that too, because I can have some of the biggest critics of Mormonism come on my program, okay? Or scholars who are critical of Joseph Smith. I've had Dan Vogel on many times. I've been on Mormon Stories, and John DeLynn's been on my show many times. Uh, Sandra Tanner has come on my program. You name it. Some of the top yeah. critics out there. Simon Southerton's been on. Thomas Murphy. They've all been on my program. And faithful Latter Day Saints watch these. Guests and they never say, Why do you let that person, why do you give that person a platform? But God forbid I have anybody that's not even far right, but just slightly right of center, and I get, yeah, Why are you platforming them? And I'm like, Man, and I tell people, Listen, I am not, I, 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 desc I describe myself as being kind of in between a uh, conservative and liberal and progressive. I'm, I'm more libertarian. So there's certain yeah. progressive ideas that I think are good, and there's certain conservative ideas I like. And so, and, and as a libertarian, I look at people as individuals. I don't look at, at people uh, collectively, collectively yeah. as groups. Yeah. I look at them as individuals, and that's how I I try to approach the subject. But man, I just I, I'm thinking here I can have these people who are absolutely think the Book of Mormon is absolute fiction, and Joseph Smith was an absolute con man, and faithful Mormons will watch the show and say, "Thanks, Steve. I was really interested to get John Dillon's perspective." Mm -hmm. But Lord, you know, then the other way around, if I have somebody just who just you know, as a basic giving a basic conservative talking point, it it's like, why are you platforming that person? That I have, I have to admit, Rod, that I have, I can attest to that as well. And I know that there are people at Fair Mormon that do not like me, okay, and 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 because they didn't they don't like the fact that I've had you on, I've had Jonathan Neville on multiple times, I've had uh, other Heartlanders on, and they don't yeah. like that, even though I have. I had Mesoamerican people. I've Brent Gardner been on my program. I've had uh, others who believe in the Meso model who maybe necessarily haven't talked about it, but I, I don't discriminate against my, I don't have a litmus test. Where do you think the Book of Mormon events happen? And, that, that, <laughs> and that's how you get on my program. So yeah, I, I can I can definitely attest to, to, to experiencing some of the same pushback that you've gotten. But I, I want to, Oh, but was there anything else you wanted to say about that? Because I wanted to kind of get back to Tim Ballard real quick too. But yeah, I, I, I probably want to just get back to Tim. Okay, so yeah. I, I just, I just, so I, I have a lot of connections with Tim Ballard's people. Okay, I, I actually at one point even invited him to come on my, on my program. I will say after reading those, um, those affidavits in October that came out about what the women said, it, I don't know, I, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable having Tim come on my program. But I, that's just my, I just want to let you know that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I just want you to share what what is your take on Tim Ballard, and where do you stand with him now? Well, maybe you should go back to uh, yeah, the, to, to you know where where did we first meet? Because I actually yeah, that talk was, about that. That was we were having uh, some of our events, that, but these are way back. <laughs> this is we'll have to take the way back machine to get them there. But but uh, but um, I had uh, this guy just contact me kind of out of the blue, and I, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it was an email. Um, and and he had found out that we were doing these uh, these uh, conferences, and we were doing them primarily up at the Zermatt Resort up in um, Midway, Utah. And uh, anyway, had uh, that he had done some uh, research involving um, this this covenant with America, and uh, he was he was in the process of working on a book called The American Covenant, and uh, and and and. 
we decided, well, let's have him come and, and speak. Felt good about that. He actually, uh, you know, came up from California and uh, where he was, this is when he was a, a, a an agent there at, along the border for the government. And, uh, and anyway, long story short is that he came up and gave this amazing presentation about this covenant relationship of America and God, you know, between God and America. And, uh, and and talked about you know the uh, George Washington and and uh, and how you know and, and Lincoln and uh, and so forth and and how uh, these men were 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 moved by religious you know principles and religious you know well gospel doctrines basically um, to uh, to establish this a, a new nation and uh, and it was just fascinating. Um, so over the course of a couple of years, we had him speak a couple of different times. And then finally, he was able to get the books done. It turned into a, book, a two book set uh, called the, the American Covenant, Volume One and Volume Two. Um, we were able to get those uh, those volumes to Glenn Beck. And uh, and that's how we got uh, that involved with uh, with Glenn Beck. Um, Glenn Beck said, well, there's all these all this Book of Mormon references in this. But she says, with my audience, I can't have a bunch of Book of Mormon stuff because they don't know even where to go to find the references and so forth. She says, could you, could you take the Book of Mormon references out and still have as powerful a book about how America is under a sacred covenant with God? And uh, Tim said, well, I'll work on it. So he so he did. He actually took the, the two books, broke them down into um, into one smaller book, and it's just called The Covenant. And then uh, published that, and and uh, I, I don't remember how many millions of copies that Glenn Beck was able to to uh, to push out to the public. But they, 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 this book called The Covenant was went out to millions and millions of people, and it was just phenomenal. And it was about that same time when Tim was still working for the um, Homeland. I think it was the Department of Homeland Security, if I remember correctly. And uh, and and he was and he, then he, then he wrote another book called the uh, the Lincoln Hypothesis. Which was just fascinating. Um, I I knew that uh, Joseph Smith and Abraham Lincoln were contemporaries of each other, but I didn't I didn't know if they had actually ever met or if they even knew about each other. And uh, Tim gives a pretty good uh, you know you know pretty uh, powerful information that they may not only have known about each other, but that uh, but that actually. The Book of Mormon played an important role in U.S. history again, as Lincoln, as Abraham Lincoln went out and actually checked out a copy of the Book of Mormon from the Library of Congress, had right. it for almost six months, and then right before, or right after he just came out with the yeah. uh, Emancipation Proclamation, he then two weeks later, after he came out with the Emancipation Proclamation, where he basically went to his cabinet, he says, uh, you know, basically that. Um, Slavery has not been the purpose of this war, but it is now. And uh, and it said he said uh, you know this, this is this is what you know God has has called me to to uh, to uh, make this war a lot more about slavery. And uh, and they said and his, and his cabinet said you know if you do this, if you if you come out with this man's place and proclamation, you're going to be killed for this. And he said. This, this is what we're going to do. It says, you know, th this is the will of God, and by God, we were going to we're going to do this. He had just read the Book of Mormon and the parts about this covenant with God between the United States and and God. Um, you know, it, or I should say America. You know, basically the promised land and God, and that gave him the the strength to uh, to to move forward with the uh, with the the, the war. And actually, from that point on, he it, it, it's, it's a fascinating book. Tremendous research. Then he started. Then, then Tim came out with the Washington hypothesis, and then the Pilgrim hypothesis, and then then slave stealers, which is another book that Tim came out with, where he he did that book um, um, after after he started OUR. I was actually invited to be part of the board of OUR hmm. um, at, at, at the beginning, and I was just too busy. I just did did not have time. To, I didn't think I could do a, uh, a, a a good job on that. So I I, I respectfully and you know kind of sadly declined. Uh, being part of the OUR board, but um, anyway, so then then we see what was going on with Tim, and uh, and OUR, and and uh, he had his first couple of uh, big um, takedowns, if you will, you know, the big uh, operations that they did, um, very successful, 
um, rescued a lot of kids and so forth. And, and, that, and that's, I mean, how can you not get behind that, right? You know, rescuing kids from trafficking and so forth and, and uh, young women, especially, um, you know, if, if, if you are a Christian, I think you have to be, you know, you, you can't sit idly by and watch this happen. So that's when we got more involved with that. Tim, um, his initial thing was actually mostly about the American covenant. And actually most of the time when he's come and spoken at our conferences, it's been on the American covenant. And then with OUR and, and saving kids is kind of a side, a side thing. Um, so I look at Tim as being primarily a uh, American covenant guy who happens to be saving, you know, to be working with saving kids. So in many, in many ways, you could see that there's a parallel between what he was doing and what you're doing. You both share a common belief in the Book of Mormon. You yeah. both uh, espouse conservative values. And so it really, it seemed to be, uh, it, it makes sense that you guys would have collaborating with, it would have collaborated with each other because yeah. there's so much overlap between yeah. your, your your organizations. Yeah, so I, so I I I do not try to hide anyway. In fact, I, I've several times over the course of years said you know, that that uh, that Tim Ballard, his uh, his kind of his his personality and his uh, his his drive and desire to do the right things is something that um, he um, I, 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 well, I've actually called him a, a, a modern day Captain Moroni you know, kind of okay. thing. So I, I I've actually said that several different times. So, uh, so we've had a fairly close relationship. I wouldn't say it's been, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, we're not like hanging out on the weekends together and that kind of stuff. Cause he's busy. I'm busy. Uh, would I like to hang out with him more on the weekends? And the answer is that I would love to hang out more with Tim Ballard and, and, uh, hopefully he'd like to hang out with me too, but mm -hmm. we just, we, we have, you know, very different, uh, lives and, and kind of, you know, things well, that we're involved with. I just want to know, I mean, with all the accusations that have been put out there, I mean, how are you responding to that? Because, because yeah. I mean, these are very serious allegations, and 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 for a yeah. lot of people, they're very credible. I I just wanted to get your take on that. Yeah, and and basically, so that's the, that's the thing. So I, I've read um, the uh, the um, the legal, okay, um, you know, the the, the accusations, basically, the lawsuits and stuff. Yeah, the lawsuits and so forth. I've read those. Um, pretty shocked, you know, honestly, at some of the things that some of the things that are being alleged that have, that happened um are very disturbing obviously you know if these things are really really did in fact happen um it's it certainly is not uh something that we would condone or or agree with um i my my, my feeling is basically this and that is that um i mean you can indict a stick i mean you, you know people can make accusations and uh, and often do i mean you look at the the, the uh kavanaugh you know uh when he was you know, for, for Supreme Court and so right, forth. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the debacle that that was and uh, just that, you know, the, 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 the false accusations and so forth that all proved out to be not true. I'm not saying that that's the case with these ladies now, um, but uh, but my, my feeling is basically this. I don't think that Tim should be tried in the court of public opinion. I think he should be tried in a court of law where both sides can be brought out Mm -hmm. um, he can actually tell his side of the story. He's never had a chance to tell his side of the story yet. And, they, and now with the, with the attorneys involved and everything, it's, a, it's basically a gag order. Right. So, so the, the ladies can, you know, can, can make whatever accusations they're going to make and so forth. But, uh, but Tim can't respond back. So that leaves him pretty vulnerable to, uh, to whatever. Um, as I understand it, there's been, you know, and as I've read those, um, uh, this is my hope. Um, I, I think that Tim, I hope that Tim will, will at some point be exonerated. But like most people, when they're when they're accused and then and then tried in the court of public opinion, um, I don't know how how he comes back from this any any time soon, even if he was found completely innocent. Um, I, 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 I my my one big concern that I do have about Tim is simply that uh, I know that when people get really passionate about certain things, um, they can get to the point where the, the passion is is so strong that you basically start to believe that, you know, the, the means justify the ends. That, you know, saving kids, no matter what you have to do, mm -hmm. you have to save these kids. And I, and I, I do feel that he had that kind of passion mm -hmm. and it can, and it can spill over into 
you know, well, you, but you can't start killing people that are hurting kids. You know, there, there, there's, there's at some point there's lines in there where you just can't cross those lines. Did Tim cross some of those lines? I don't know. Mm. Um, I, I think it's, it's fascinating to see how some people will make it, you know, none of the accusations involve that, that Tim was having, you know, full on intercourse with these other, with these women, you know, but there were things that certainly seemed to be inappropriate. But then again, he's in, he, we, we don't deal in a world like I don't, I luckily I'm so grateful that I don't deal in a world that Tim's dealing with, with traffickers. Okay. You know, it is a sick, dark world that people want to uh, to you know to uh, defile these these beautiful young children and these young women, and so forth. And in order to you know to to play the role of somebody who who wants to have and, and set up these sting operations, you basically have to go into that world. So Tim has to almost live a double life. A lot, a lot of agents have major problems and PTSD and so forth from, mm-hmm. from, uh, from having to experience this kind of stuff. I think we need to hold off judgment on Tim until the, the, the facts of the matter come out. I have personal friends of him that are, that are, that are close to him. Um, I have not had any personal conversations with him. Um, mostly because of the fact that I, I think that he's under a gag order and can't have the conversations anyway. I was going to drop by his house actually and go see him, and and uh, and a friend of his said he, he can't, no, he he can't have anybody uh, come and see him even, um, you know, because of the, the the lawsuit. So that's my 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 take on it. Basically, keep your powder dry. Um, don't. Um, my feeling is, is we're not making any kind of accusations for or against. Uh, Tim until the facts of the case come out and uh and then I, and then I, I hope that Tim will be exonerated if he isn't then uh then then obviously he'll he'll uh face the, uh, the whatever consequences of that um I am just grateful that I have not had to be put in the position that Tim has been put in to try to to, to act like a, a uh mm-hmm. a pedophile and um and and have to be in that realm. I don't even want. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But I'm glad that somebody mm-hmm. had the courage to do it. Okay. And and I, I don't think we can uh, take away from the fact that there has been, you know, hundreds if not thousands of kids who have been rescued from child trafficking because of Tim and Operation Underground Railroad. I'm not ready to throw them completely under the bus. I think that they need to have their opportunity to tell their side of the story. Okay. So that's, well, that's I think. Where I'm at. Okay, so and I think you know Tim is a friend of yours. Uh, he's really a hero to you in many ways, you know. Yeah. And uh, he's written yeah. these books that really resonate with you and your community. And and you feel like he needs to have his uh, day in court and given a fair hearing. And yeah. uh, and give well, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, this story. Yeah, yeah. If, if if you're if you're a Christian, you kind of have to li- realize that you know. I mean, one one uh, uh, one bad episode or or a bad time in somebody's life does not necessarily negate all the good that they've done in their lives. We all make mistakes. This is the reason why we need Christ, right? Okay. This is the reason why we need the atonement. And uh, we all make, you know, mistakes and that kind of thing. But, uh, but, but, but bottom line is, I mean, look at David, <laughs> you know, right. I mean, all the good that he did, you know, in his life, you can focus on, on the, the one time he, he seriously messed up, you know, or you can look at uh, all of the other good that he did Luckily, luckily that that judgment is not for for me to decide. That judgment is going to be for for Christ to decide. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to Christ. And, and well, the same thing with Tim. Okay, well, I'm glad you're able to you know give your perspective on this because I know people want to hear it, and a lot of people have you know tried to tie you in with a lot of these different groups and people, and 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 and, and sometimes it's because they want to you know. Uh, kids assassinate your character, you know, by guilt by association. And so I think, yeah. it was, actually, I'm really glad that you kind even, of- Even that is really silly. I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know, I, but... if, you, if you're going to say that, you got you to say, well, you know, that people like, you know, uh, Paul H. Dunn or, or you know, I mean, other other people, it, whenever you have a lot of people involved with uh, with a lot of different things, Everybody has their agency and can make their own decisions. And sometimes those decisions are not necessarily the same ones that you would make. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that just because you were a friend of them. I mean, if, if that's the case, then we all have to castigate Christ, right? Right. 
because yeah. he hung out with the with the with the tax collectors and and uh, you know harlots and so forth. Yeah. You know, he, he if you're guilty by association, then then you have to throw Christ under the bus too. And I'm not willing to do that. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think I think it's really good for people to get your perspective. But I also think what you did was really important. Was you kind of went we went back in time and went to the origins of all these things, so people get better understanding about your relationships that you've built. And that's the other thing too, Rod. Because you are a growing movement, there would be people who maybe are malevolent actors who would want to attach themselves to your movement for their own gain as well. So that that's just the reality yeah. of the situation. And and then the, through no fault of your own, uh, but that's going to happen, especially as you can continue to gain prominence and people are going to use you and your name to to maybe put for, for their own agenda and their own purposes. So I think people also need to be aware of that as well. You know, I, I have to say, um, I really appreciate my friendship with you. And uh, one of the cool Likewise. things <laughs> that I got to do was last time I went out in Utah was I got to go see a movie with you. And it was called The Oath. And I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that movie and your relationship with the director uh, of the film as well. Because you actually, a week before everybody else got to see the movie, you got to go to Beverly Hills and see the Hollywood premiere of The Oath and actually drove back with the, the director of the movie, from my understanding, if I'm yeah, not mistaken, yeah, yeah, and got there. to hang out with him. So maybe just talk about that whole experience. <laughs> yeah, well, well, basically, so Darren Southam has been a, a, a fairly regular on our uh, at our events. Um, he's probably spoken five or six times, I think, at our different events. And uh, and he a little bit about Darren South and so a little bit about his background. I mean, he he was an actor, actually has has played the role of Christ in several of the uh, the, the the LDS Church uh, films and so forth. Um, deeply spiritual individual, um, wonderful family. His wife is just fantastic and so forth. Anyway, so um, and he he started off actually just wanting to make an epic film uh, on the Book of Mormon. Now, th those of you who know, I mean, we've had uh, Keith Merrill, who, for example, he's a good friend of mine, um, and 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 I had an amazing email from him just out of the blue one time, oh, back in two thousand and eight, I think it was or so, where he just watched my DVD and he and he gave me this this glowing like, this is well, he he basically made the made the comment that um, that this has changed his life and 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 uh, excited him in remarkable ways and he says I, I think I'm more excited and energized I think this is the actual quote I'm more energized tonight in my testimony of the Book of Mormon than I've been in years this is Keith Merrill that made and directed the testaments he did uh Mr Kruger's Christmas he did um the the, the shell legacy for the church it was actually in the, the the film that was being played in the in the um uh the the Joseph Smith memorial building there just on on uh, the temple square area anyway and uh so i mean he's he's a uh award-winning you know cinematographer and so forth and, and bottom line is is that uh, he had this amazing uh experience with with my first dvd and uh and so as a, as a filmmaker you know he's done some of the biggest projects in the church um he always talked about how president uh president spencer w kimball um, had this this uh, this vision of of uh, some great uh, Book of Mormon film that would come out that would that would go all over the world, right? That would introduce people to the Book of Mormon story, and uh, and, and Keith Merrill always wanted to be kind of the one that got to do that. But then Keith's been involved with a whole lot of other projects and so forth, and uh, and and that kind of thing. So and then the church did away with the uh, Legacy Theater, and uh, etc. So that's kind of been sitting in the back burner for a long time, but uh, Darren Southam knew about that and, uh, and and wanted to, you know, help with making a a, a, a great uh, Book of Mormon film that would that would be available to see in theaters all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he set out to do that. The first thing he did was actually because there's no, you know, we don't have uh, a lot of you know bazillionaires in our in our uh, infrastructure here, so we've got. So, uh, so he had to go out and raise money. So he did a, um, I, I think it's a GoFundMe kind of a deal, where uh, he, he raised a bunch of money to to do a pilot short mm -hmm. as to what was going to be this. And and the and pilot short of, was reign of a, judges, oh, reign of judges, oh, reign of right? judges. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So the reign of judges was the pilot short that he did, um, and and uh, it, was, it was pretty phenomenal. But basically, it had to do with Captain Moroni. Mm -hmm. 
but when you when it when it comes down to making films and uh, and funding them, that's a whole other story, <laughs> you know. I mean, most Hollywood films are you know thirty to to, to three hundred million dollars to make a film, right? And but the, the, but kind of at the minimum, you're looking at about a hundred million dollars to do a film. Well, obviously, he didn't have that kind of money. So, uh, but he got some some amazing actors. There were so many different kind of miraculous things that happened. Uh, and that's got, uh, you know, fabulous actors and so forth to be able to come in, non LDS actors. And so they made the pilot film, Reign of Judges. But in order to do big war scenes, that's expensive. Either you have to have hundreds and hundreds of extras and, and, and all kinds of costuming and so forth, or you have to be able to afford CGI, you know, computer generated um, stuff. And, uh, and that's, you know, only the biggest, you know, um, film, you know, producers can have the have the budgets to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, so he had to make a pretty hard decision as to do, do, are we going to try to go with the reign of judges, the uh, the the movie about uh, the um, Captain Moroni, <laughs> or do something that we that we could get into a budget that that was realistic. And so he, so uh, our, our infrastructure is part of mostly the ones that were helping to fund him. Um, he did a lot of stuff online and whatever. Um, got another another amazing cast of actors and and uh, so forth. I think I think he said something like ninety percent of the people involved with the making of the film are not LDS, hmm. not members of our faith, which is which is actually quite a quite a feat. I mean that's that's pretty amazing. That he's able to even even do that because a lot of people hear that you know it's, it's, it has to do with this thing called the Book of Mormon. The only thing that people, a lot of people know about the Book of Mormon is, is that it's, it's, there's controversy surrounding it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, be able to get these, uh, these, these big time actors and actresses to, uh, to, you know, to come and be a part of that was, was a pretty amazing thing. Um, and then, but it, so I had a chance to come out, uh, Darren invited me to come out to the premiere there in Hollywood at, in, Be in Beverly Hills. And, uh, and it was awesome. We had about probably four or 500 people that were there at the theater there. Um, and, uh, and after, after the film was over, gave it a, st a standing ovation. Hmm. And then he had a Q and a time after the film. And there was all these people who are not of our faith asking all kinds of questions about, well, what are these gold plates? <laughs> You know, yeah. where are they now? <laughs> you know, what's going on with these things? And he's answering these questions up on the thing and, and trying to trying to answer this kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And then anyway, so he um it, it was fascinating to see how people, especially the Native American community, you know, were responding to this. Because most of the actors that were in the film are actually Native American. Mm -hmm. And uh and 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 being able to kind of tie their their potential ancestry back to Book of Mormon. I mean, if that's the case, then the Book of Mormon is literally the history of their ancestry, at least some of them, right? And so it, it's, it's interesting how the perspective is. But the bottom line is, is that uh, it, so it, it came out in theaters. It started off in about 600 something theaters, which is about, well, it's a, it's a third of what uh, Sound of Freedom did with, uh, with Tim Ballard's film. Right. Um, so it was a lot less theaters. They didn't, they, they spent pretty much all of the, the, the money that they had in, in the making of the film. And, and with a lot of films, the, the making of the film was only half of their budget. The other half is promotion of the promotion. film. Yep. So there was just no, there was just no money left for promotion of the film. Um, and then also you had to get good buy-in with that, with the, within the membership of the church. And I think that the, one of the big problems that they that we had or that Darren had with the film is that um, members of the church were thinking that it was going to be a film depicting scenes of the Book of Mormon. Right. And that's not what it was about. Um, it was actually a way of, of kind of instead of being in your face, this is what the Book of Mormon is about. It was a, a roundabout way of introducing people who are not of our faith. To the Book of Mormon through a love story, which, as you know, there's not very many love stories in the Book of Mormon. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, kind of, it's not one of those things we have a lot of in the in the Book of Mormon. There's not a lot of uh, of that kind of thing. So, uh, but but out there in the world in general, love stories are still something that people have to like to see. Yeah. And so he basically wound it into a, a fictional love story 
that that tells the the background and, and a, a lot of information about the Book of Mormon and some of its prime characters, you know, like Captain Moroni and so forth, are yep. mentioned specifically in there. And actually, one of my favorite scenes in the movies, Rod, is when actually um, when Moroni is describing to Bathsheba the uh, and Bathsheba is the love interest in this film. For those of you who don't know, yeah. um, is is that he actually has a scroll that kind of gives a summation of the Book of Mormon, which exactly. I thought was really cool. Like if you're going to give an introduction to the Book of Mormon, that was actually a pretty good primer. It re- it was it was fantastic, and, and basically it comes across. As not in your face, the people who you know, so you know, it's not it's not a uh, proselytizing kind of a thing. You know, it's just this is this is what the uh, this is what the the scroll was basically laying out, and he was laying it out for her, for mm-hmm. Bathsheba to be able to understand a little bit more about why the their two histories were separated, and about the you know the different brothers and so forth that they're talked about in the Book of Mormon. So that's a uh, anyway, I, I I felt that it was a really uh, a, a good indirect way of introducing people to the Book of Mormon without having to go see the Book of Mormon musical, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is of course basically mocking and making fun of uh, the church right. and its and its beliefs. So uh, so I I I I felt like it was a uh, it was a it's a it's a nice love story. It's filmed beautifully. It was also filmed in the right location, which I love that too. Everything was filmed within the United States, and and probably 80, 90 percent of it was filmed in New York. Yes, so, which is Heartlander uh, so territory. That that's that's right. Heartlander territory. There was no Mesoamerica stuff in it. There was no, you know, stone pyramids that are never mentioned in the Book of Mormon or palm trees that are never mentioned in the Book of Mormon or jaguars or any of the other animals that are never mentioned in the Book of Mormon and so forth. It's It, it had a bear in it with, and, and that kind of stuff. So it was definitely a North American setting. I love that part. Unfortunately, it didn't do as well as we had hoped. Um, we'll see what happens with it in the future and, and, what, and what the future holds. The idea was as if this film went well, then there would be uh, a, the uh, the prequel to it, which is actually the the, the Captain Moroni yeah. or chapter right. stuff, which would be really fascinating. Well, you know, what's interesting, Rod, is sometimes you'll have movies that don't do super well at the box office, but then they become kind of underground cult hits on the DVD circuit and on the streaming circuit. So it just makes you yeah. wonder if maybe um, that will be the place where maybe the revenues would be generated to create yeah. the, the, you know, and this is the thing. There were non-members in the past that had a vision of doing uh, a, a, a Book of Mormon movie, including Cecil B. DeMille. When, yeah. you know, who gave us the Ten Commandments? He was good friends with <laughs> Arnold Freiberg, who helped do the 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 the, the concept art for the film, yeah. and actually t- t- was became friends with David O. McKay, and really expressed interest in doing a Book of Mormon uh, movie. Which I tell people, in some alternative timeline, that movie was made, and then, you know, like, <laughs> in a, in another in a, another universe or something. Would that be awesome? <laughs> I know. I thought. Can you imagine if the Cecil B. DeMille made a Book of Mormon movie? Oh my gosh, that would have been incredible. Well, let me tell you, if Darren Southam would have had the budget that Cecil B. DeMille's had to make yeah. the Ten Commandments, it would have been a different movie, I'm sure. But yeah, <laughs> and, and, and to be fair, I, th- I think people were anticipating it would be more along the lines of Reign of Judges. And yeah. so I think they were a little disappointed that maybe it was the story they thought, you know. And so so I think there was just a lot of different go- things going on here. Um, yeah. I'm just I was I was just honored and privileged to be able to come and w- watch the opening night there with you in the theater. And, it was so awesome to have you there. Thank and you. For about, and I, I was, <laughs> uh, yeah, and I was talking with somebody on the phone who I met there, um, who, uh, who she uh, talked with her on the phone yesterday. So I mean, uh, you know, it was, it was cool because a lot of people recognized me there in the theater because of yeah. you know of everything, which was really great. And so I made friendships with people. And you know, this is the key thing. You know, I mean, you know, I look at this. Rod Meldrum is a believer in the Book of Mormon. Rod Meldrum believes that the Book of Mormon and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Restoration and Joseph Smith are all under attack. And Rod Meldrum is uh, basically, uh, if you will, going up on a hill and putting up his standard of liberty, saying uh, we are going to fight and we're going to fight back. We're going to push back for our values. And that's how you see the world. That's how you understand it. And, And so for you to take the positions that you're taking are perfectly understandable why you would be doing it. If Rod Meldrum didn't exist, there would be another Rod Meldrum doing what you're doing. You are the man man who stepped stepped in the gap and is saying, okay, um, standing with wart history and yelling stop, if you will, and saying, listen, um, what do we stand for as a people? What do we believe about the Book of Mormon? Is it scripture? 
do you know do we take it literally is it a history of a, a real people that existed in, in exactly. of the ancient inhabitants exactly. and that's what you're that's what you're saying so this is what we've been taught we've been the this is what we're we're to believe this is what the original converts to the book of mormon believed are are we are we going to betray our legacy because of what of of other things that are coming out and other scholarship? I I think what you are doing is perfectly understandable and why you would be doing it. And I think it's really important for the audience to hear what makes you tick, what where you're coming from, and and why you're doing what you're doing. You 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 literally saw a sign that was challenging the Book of Mormon one day about DNA in the Book of Mormon, and that led you down that path. And and folks, just so you know. I've had Thomas Murphy on my program and he's come in and pushed back on you. And he's given his, he's written papers with Southern, Simon Southerton based on some of the work that he did here on the channel. Yeah. And we're hoping just to preview, just to let you all know that uh, I can't give too many details because not everything's out there, but we're going to be doing something with Thomas Murphy sometime this year where we're going to basically uh, uh, have a conversation that I will be moderating and it will actually be on another platform. Uh, I'll leave it at that. And, uh, and and we're going to have uh, Rob Meldrum make his presentation, and then Thomas Murphy be able to uh, give his uh, his his re refutation to it or his answer to you, your your presentation. And then we're going to have a civil conversation afterwards. And Thomas Murphy, when he came on my program, said uh, after he came on after you were on my program, he said, "I would like to do lunch with Rob Meldrum one day." And see, that's what <laughs> I want to do. I want Thomas Murphy and I want Rob Meldrum to have lunch with each other. <laughs> And, well, and like, that's likewise. really what it's all about. I, I, again, we 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 can uh, disagree with each other, and I, I think this is one of the biggest problems that we have in our country today, is the inability to have conversations between people who have very even completely different points of view, but still have a civil conversation and not have it have it, you know, devolve into you know personal attacks and 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 so forth and so on. You know, there's there's um. There's there's a place in there for conversation, and if if, if it goes into contention, um, usually contention is is when you know everybody's entrenched into their. I mean, it's basically like war, right? You have one side and and the other side, and they're basically going at war with each other, and uh, and nothing's going to change their position. Um, and and I, I will have to say that I'm probably you know stuck in there as well. But but I I'd at least like to listen to and let other people hear, and then let the truth just out. You know, just um, it's kind of like Wayne, Wayne May has a saying I love, and that is that uh, I I report you decide, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and let let people come to their own conclusions. I my 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 feeling is basically also this, and that is that uh, in the uh, in the restored gospel. Uh, if if we've got that right, and I think we do, as, as far as the the, uh, the preexistence, there was this war in heaven, right? Um, and 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 a third of the hosts of heaven chose Satan's plan over God's plan. So if I I look at it this way, if our heavenly Father can't get a third of his kids to listen to his plan and to accept it, then I'm not going to be all that worried if I if I have pushback from people and they don't want to accept what I say or whatever because I mean you know God God's got to probably be the you know the ultimate uh, you know an influencer <laughs> you know so so uh, you know so I, I don't get too uptight if people don't agree with me or don't accept my 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 thoughts or whatever I like to listen to them um, many times I won't agree with them, but, uh, but I'd like to at least listen and see what, what is the, what is the reasoning? What is the logic? What is the, the feeling? Um, you know, where, where does this lead to? What are the fruit of what they're saying and put all those things together. And, and I think, you know, the, uh, the pursuit of truth is where we're, is what I, what I anticipate or what I hope to accomplish. Okay, well, that's great. And I just want to, I'm pulling up your website here. Uh, you have Book of Mormon Evidence.org, and I'm actually in the bookstore section here. Uh, is it showing up on your screen, uh, Rod? Yeah, yeah, it okay. is. Yeah. And so basically, right now, you've got some sales going on that you wanted me to talk about. And of course, we got Jonathan Neville's books, and we've got the, uh, uh, the Annotated Book of Mormon series, the Annotated Scriptures series. Um, yeah. and, uh, and of course, I got that whole set as well. And so this is the uh, website. So I'm going to have a, a, um, a link in the description. And also, I just want to ask you, Rod, I want you to kind of preview for the audience your mm -hmm. upcoming uh, Firm Foundation conferences. Uh, I see here you've got some early bird specials going on. The next one is April 19th through the 20th. 
and uh, yep. you have some specials going on here. Um, talk about what and these awesome. these prices are good till March fifteenth of twenty twenty four. So if you're interested in attending, that's uh, the early bird. It's the early this bird is a, this is a, a three day a three day event, and uh, you can see, <laughs> that the, I mean, you know, fifty sixty bucks. I mean. I don't know how many, how many events there are, there are that are two or three day events where you have uh, hundreds of, you know, well, I should say dozens, probably 70, 80 speakers, yeah. you know, over three days uh, for 50 bucks a, a person. I mean, that's, you know, we, we try to keep these things as, as, as uh, a- absolutely inexpensive as we can. So like there, there's a three day pass for an individual is 50 bucks or a couple for 90 bucks for three days. That's pretty amazing. Uh, if you can kind of, kind of scroll to the top there just a little bit, let me kind of just touch on a couple of quick things. Other, otherwise we'll kind of wrap it up here, sure. but, uh, but we, we, uh, so four years ago um, we did, like, as you mentioned in the, in the beginning of the podcast here um, four years ago, we did a whole series of, uh, of interviews um, that followed along with the come follow me program of the church. Right. Yeah. And so every week there would be, you know, certain chapters and so forth in the Book of Mormon that would be uh, in in focus. And so we had uh, we brought in you know, experts in all kinds of different areas to to talk about those things each week. So you can see some of that kind of thing going on there. Um, unfortunately, we put it all on our on our YouTube channel, which at the time was uh, was Come Follow Me 2020. <laughs> right and of course that doesn't work in 2024 right yes so but but it it was so many hours of of such great research and the information in it is still completely valid i mean nothing has changed as far as the book of mormon evidences is concerned in the last four years other than additional new information so uh so what we've been doing this year with the uh, with the churches come follow me program is we're at at, we are um re-releasing on our on our main website which is book of mormon evidence dot org on youtube okay I and mean, you can go to youtube and go to book of mormon evidence and you have, you have to kind of put in the dot org right now um but uh but then it pulls up the playlists and you can watch the ones that we did four years ago which again okay. is still valid uh but then there's been so much new information so jonathan and i had an awesome interview it ended up being about four hours long um in in considering what we should do this year for the come follow me program um, we, we kind of decided that actually there's, there's, there's already dozens of come follow me. I mean, there's like 65 different come follow me things that people can watch where they go through the lesson and that kind of stuff. And my feeling is, is that, uh, there's, there's plenty of that already. Um, we wanted to do something that would go into more depth, more detail, more, okay. uh, more, more, you know, meat and potatoes kind of stuff. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're not necessarily following the Come Follow Me chapters each week. We are just putting out content that will be not not year specific. This is something okay. that we that people can you know next year and the year after that and the year after that and, and forever they can they can still uh, you know use this information. So so we're doing deep dives. Uh, Jonathan and I had a four and a half, I think, almost five hours long. Uh, interview and we're releasing that you know, about, about bits at a time or you know about a, a chunk at a time about an hour at a time each week so what we're what we're hoping people will do is if they want to if they want to follow along with the come follow me thing um just go to our 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 um uh previous ones that we that we've redone we uh, unfortunately we lost like three and a half million views Mm-hmm. Um, on, when we moved everything from the Come Follow Me 2020 back to our main our, our main YouTube channel, yeah. So that was a bummer, but uh, but anyway, it, it it is what it is, and we're just having to you know, uh, hopefully the Lord will bless us to be able to keep keep getting the information out there. Anyway, so bottom line is, so we have the uh, that's that's our our program for this year. Um, we're just going deep dives on different subjects. We're not necessarily following the 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 weekly come follow me situation if you want to do that you can go go you know check that out there's there's a lot of great ones out there and uh but if you want to do a deep dive that's what we're about okay well that's great down just a little bit further was our event so we have coming up there just a little a bit about that so it's going to be at the uh the the, um mountain america event center in sandy utah if we go down just a little bit more than that there we go there we go okay so and, and by the way, a lot, a lot of people want to know what, what you know, don't care what you guys think. I just want to know what the scriptures think, what the scriptures say in regard to the heartland stuff. 
And so just just up, just a little bit up from that is the uh, the, the scriptural basis. That's that's always oh. there at the top of the website. Okay. So if you click yeah. on that, you can actually get to the the, the scriptural basis. It's an article that uh, that I put together a number of years ago okay. that just shows the scriptural foundations of our research. All that right. We're not just uh, wild-eyed crazies again. And then the then we have the early bird passes and so forth, and they're, they're going from there. And I see children under 18 are free. So really, this is a great place to take your family, your kids. Yeah, it is. It um, is. And, and so it's it's just, it has a lot going on there. Um, you really are, you know, it's amazing the impact that you are having in the uh, Latter-day Saint world, in the Book of Mormon yeah. believing world. Um, and really it is, outside of General Conference, this is one of the biggest events. And I hope to one day be able to give my presentation, a Protestant <laughs> defense of the Book of Mormon, to your group. My well, goal we probably is, need to do that. You haven't had a chance yet. But, well, what the heck? I need to get uh, my my Ryan is my uh, my events manager, and so I need to get him uh, get get you get you there. Yeah, I think I tried but, reaching out to Ryan a while back. I never heard back. But I think, yeah. uh, and I may be misremembering, but my goal yeah. is to give my a, a Protestant defense of the Book of Mormon presentation to the Firm Foundation and to Sunstone. I want to do both. And, all right, all right. and 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 I feel like this is because again that's me just being the neutral the only neutral Mormon podcaster out there I'm the Switzerland of Mormonism yeah. as Dr. Randy Bell likes to call it and I like to be able to present uh, my views on this subject as well and really yeah. I, I just want to say it was a real honor and privilege for you to come on Mormon Book Reviews today sir well thank you so much Stephen I sure appreciate that hopefully it's uh, it's helpful to kind of you know let people know about what's going on here as far as that that's concerned uh one, one of the things i was going to just lastly mention and that yeah. is that the uh um prior to covid uh we were we when we do these events i mean it just got almost crazy we had like 7500 people coming to these events and it was just they were just huge um and since that point um yeah it's kind of funny because we um before covid uh, I just felt like we needed to get all of these. The, the only way you could see these presentations was you had to come to the events because we yes. we would record them, but yeah. we had no way of getting them out to the public, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing uh, after the fact. So you, you either you came or you didn't get to see the presentations. Um, and then I, we started realizing there's so much amazing content. We just, we've got to make this available after that for people who live in other countries and so forth that, I mean, we we have like uh, eight, I think it's something like eighty countries that we have uh, you know people coming to, to see our research and stuff. Anyway, so uh, so we we decided that uh, we needed to put a, make a a streaming website, which we did, and we started putting all this stuff on the streaming website. Um, because of that, a lot of people now know that they can they don't have to come and get a hotel and oh, yeah, okay. transportation yeah. and right. flights and everything else to come to the event. So. We, it's actually been kind of nice because the events are a little bit smaller. We still mm -hmm. have maybe, typically about 3,500 to you know, 4,000 people over the okay. three days. So about 1,500 to 2,000 people a day typically. Um, and, uh, and and that, but then but we record everything. We put them up on the streaming website. So if, if anybody is interested in that, that's really kind of where the, our, everything is going now. So well, yeah, is your we, streaming website, is that on bookofmormonevidence.org as well yeah 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 okay. if you if you, if, right. if you want to pull that up again I can okay, just sure. you, basically you just click on that real quick i mean i know we need to we need to wrap this up but basically this is kind of an important thing because that's where people can go to get more more information so if you want to see the podcast it's there on the right hand side you scroll down just a little bit further beyond below that there it is so it's book of mormon evidence streaming if you check it if you click on that then it takes you to the streaming website there's a couple oh, different okay. plans but basically, it's like, you know, $7.97 a month, kind of like, you know, any of the other streaming, you know, like Netflix and, and you, you know, other, you know, Disney and, and Plex and so forth that you want to, if you want to do that. Um, but this gives you access to over 1,500 presentations and information about the Book of Mormon. Oh, and wow. it's, 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 it's a huge site that has just, you know, thousands and thousands of, uh, of, uh, of, of, well, not thousands and thousands, but about, like I said, about 1,500 or so presentations from our different things. There's, there's one with Alex Boyer. We've, we've had, uh, the, you know, like, um, you know, Glenn Beck has got stuff on there. You can you can uh, search things up there in the top there. Wow. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, just, like I said, I mean, they're, they're just so much information. If, if you go on the sites, they have Hidden in the Heartland series. That's the series that was actually... Oh, yeah. 
done by Kells Goodman. Yeah. Just an awesome series. You have the you know, trailers for a bunch of different events there. Latter day radio podcasts. Um, yeah. th- these are some of our previous ones. So we have like Eric Mutzos and uh and, and Greg Madsen of the Quick Media. Oh, yeah. He's uh, all Kate, my, I mean, I've had Greg on a couple of times. I, yeah, I've Kate Daly is time. just amazing. Um, but again, most of these are conservative, you know, Jennifer Orton and that kind of stuff. You know, Ken Krog is a, is a personal friend of mine as well. Hannah Stoddard. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, we could just go on and on, but we have, uh, just tremendous uh, speakers, uh, a, a wealth of knowledge here. Uh, so uh, much good information here. Like I said, but, but about fifteen hundred different presentations on science and religion, Book of Mormon, or you know the, the last expo, recently added ones, and uh, so that's yeah. And that starts at seven <laughs> seven ninety seven a month as as yeah. low as that. And not going to break the bank. It's basically a burger and fries. Yeah, uh, worth a month, you know, to, be, to have so, access to all this information anytime you want to on any on any platform. You can, you know, you can see right. it on your phone or your computer or whatever. So, all right. Well, anyway, Stephen, thank you so much. I sure appreciate you letting me uh, kind of, <laughs> you know, go into some of these details yeah. and so forth. And uh, looking forward to uh, our our conversation with Thomas Murphy and yeah, and uh, so forth with that. We're just and, trying to uh, just trying to get people to talk to each other. That's all we want to do: get people to talk to each other. Thank you for what you do, and yeah, uh, God bless you, brother. God bless you too. So folks, just a reminder, there will be links in the description to everything we just talked about. For those of you who'd like to financially support the channel, we do have links in the description there as well, including our merch store, MBR, or morningbookreviews.com. And I do want to tell everybody who are financially supporting this channel, I could not do this without you. I could not make the frequent trips to Utah and the rest of the country without you. And and also the revenue that we're generating on on YouTube has really been a blessing. And I hope that 2024 will even be, uh, even greater things will be accomplished in this work. And remember, the most important thing is this, folks, is remember, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.